All right. We are here today to talk a little bit more about steel. The um, context of this discussion and uh, the steel that we're going to be talking about is going to be mostly in the context of uh, fixed blade knives, bush knives, survival knives, etc. So um, this might not be entirely applicable to fixed blade guys, but we're going to get right into it and really nerd out. And all of the information that's going to be posted here is openly and publicly available at Knife Steel Nerds. I'll put a link in the description box below, as well as pinned in the comments below. So let's go ahead. Let's cut through the marketing crap and get right down to real verifiable information. Hello, I'm Jacob, your host, and you're watching the Preppers Bunker Outdoors. If you enjoy the content, I'd ask that you like and subscribe. Also, check out the description box below, and you can see where you can support this channel through Patreon, through my websites, Beach and Tactical, where I sell rifle slings, as well as Exodus Knife and Tool, where I sell my knives. Um, we also have affiliate links in there, and the sponsor for this month is uh, myself. April 1st, I'm going to be doing an auction on some of the rarest Exodus knife and tool knives that I've ever had to include uh, one-off prototypes and my own personal knives. We will also have some other really cool knives and all of these proceeds will either go to uh, the release of the Exodus knife and tool Legionnaire for setup and tooling or they will go directly to knife rights that will be clarified on April 1st and in future videos. There is some really legendary stuff that's going to be available. So if you are interested, make sure you're there because this is a chance that will never come again. Anyways, let's get you right back to the content. All right, so um, we are here. We are looking at our simple high carbon steels for the most part today. And we will get into some other stuff to some degree, but let me start this video by saying, that a lot of uh, knife manufacturers, marketers, businesses, etc., they are going to choose a knife steel or method of making knives that is the most cost effective for them. Then they're going to go to their marketing team and ask their marketing team to make the decisions that they made marketable. Okay. So let's just say that we have an imaginary steel called um, carbon Y. Okay. It's carbon Y steel, the toughest steel that's ever been made. Uh, we're going to use carbon Y steel um, for one of a few reasons. For one, because it's the cheapest steel we can get. For two, because since we call it carbon Y, we can actually use whatever steel that we want and just keep calling it carbon Y to keep our costs low, depending on whichever steel's selling the cheapest at auction that day or whatever. Uh, and uh, the other reason is if we call it carbon Y, we market carbon, carbon Y, we're constantly harping on carbon Y. It's easy to remember. People don't actually want information. They don't actually want data. Uh, they're going to buy into the marketing more easily. Uh, those are good. That is something that a company may do. Also, let's say that a company only does hollow grinds because you can hollow grind knives way faster. Time is money, right? Uh, so they only do hollow grinds. So they're going to tell you why through years of research and development, the hollow grind is the superior grind or convex. Uh, convex edges are freaking, you can do a convex edge uh, also quicker. You're removing less material. Convex edges are freaking the toughest, hold the edge the longest, etc. Flat grind. I don't know why anybody would market flat grinds. Potentially the most difficult grind of them to, you know, produce uh, when it comes to cost or whatever. But Scandi grind, Scandi grind. I hear so many people say, Scandi grind is the best because it carves the best, it bites the deepest, and it's the toughest. Now, a lot of these people can't even define what a Scandi grind is. So whatever it is that a company chooses to do, 
They're going to market it. That is marketing. Now, I am here uh, representing a knife company. And if I make a decision, I'll tell you honestly why I made that decision. But everything that we're going to talk about here is going to be based off of knife nerds. It's actually this way. Uh, Dr. Laren Thomas, uh, the dude's a metallurgist. He does not own a knife company. He's a metallurgist. Very very well respected in the community. And his data is based on scientific testing um, that is objective, repeatable. And uh, I don't remember what else I was going to say there, but this is information that anybody can get. So we're not, I'm not using this as whatever. Check him out. This is not just some Facebook book group crap. This is not just some foreign forum hearsay. This is not just some custom maker who chose to do 52100 and who is going to tell you that he found the magic heat treat that turned his wakazashi into a dagon. Stop that crap. All right. Also, um, to give some seasoning to this data that we have here, um, I'm going to interject my experiences based on almost a decade of consistent knife use and how I come to my conclusions. And the reason that I learn is because if one knife uh, performs better than another knife or one thing does better than another thing, just knowing that it does better is not enough for me. I, I am a person with a lot of questions and I need to know why? And I don't need to just know why, I have to understand why. So you can scroll back if you want to see what I've actually done or if I actually know anything about what I'm talking about. Scroll back, got almost 10 years of footage of hard knife use across basically every brand, across a huge number of steels. And some of these steels here, I don't have experience with. I'm happy to tell you that. So I'm not going to uh, tell you that I know anything that I don't know. So let's just get right started here. Um, I wish I could use my mouse and you guys could see it on the screen, but we don't. Let's see. And I, of course, get a little mixed up here. We have toughness along your vertical axes and we have edge holding along your horizontal. Now you'll notice that the best edge holding steel here on this list, Apex Ultra, has a toughness, I'm sorry, edge holding of four along the bottom there. Now four as a edge holding um, rating is not all that high, but to put it into perspective, you look at 1095 is down at one and a half on edge holding and 01 is at two on edge holding and 01 has based on, and these, these steels are heat treated ideally. We are looking at a metallurgist who is the guy that you would want to go to for your heat treat, all right? So this is not one company and one company's heat treat that they looked up on Google or on Blade Forums and now that they use, this is the guy who creates heat treat recipes for the industry. So this is this is not and your 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 favorite maker does not have the magic heat treat. There's no such thing as a magic heat treat. There's an ideal heat treat and everything else is a subpar heat treat by degree. So you know O1 not really much superior to 1095. It's more expensive. Your knife is probably going to be more expensive in 01. But in the bush, are you going to notice a difference between 01 and 90, 1095 if ideally heat treated? Probably not. Um, but this is our standard, guys. This right here is our industry standard for manufacturing for customs, for everything, we are at a edge holding of one and a half and a toughness of four and a half. Now I will say I already did a video referencing steels, talking about why for my brand, I chose S35VN for my fixed blade knives here. Uh, Exodus knife and tool, small, uh, so as of right now, small fixed blade knives. 
And uh, in that, uh, I referenced uh, uh, 1095's toughness incorrectly. So I want to go ahead and apologize about that. I didn't have the chart in front of me. I thought I remembered the toughness being at three and a half. The toughness is, in fact, at four and a half. So some of the things I said were not quite correct. That's all right, because I mentioned in the video that I wasn't quite positive. But I don't like being wrong, especially if I can correct it. And by the way, guys, uh, since I mentioned that, what better way to learn is there than being wrong? Every other thing that we learn, we learn the hard way through pain and struggle and everything else. But someone can just say, hey, you're wrong. And then you can look it up and be like, hey, I'm wrong. So yeah, I'll, I'll eat crow every day on this channel if I have to, and I'll get better every single time. So down here on edge holding, we have super blue. Uh, and uh, we do not have a lot of toughness here. And we've got a direct line that goes up to 8670, which is the top of this chart, and 5160, which are right below. You'll see that for the use of this chart, the edge holding on 8670, 5160, for all intents and purposes, is the same as 1095. Now, if you go to Knife Steel Nerds, you can find some uh, data that points to 1095 being slightly better but slightly better is not going to be something that you notice in the bush. Typically, when you are working in the bush with wood and with skin, with fur, with whatever, you're looking at relatively low abrasive materials and a lot of tasks that are not taxing on an edge. Whereas if you're using a folder in, a work, in an urban work environment, your cardboards, your papers, your straps, all of that stuff's incredibly high abrasive. But we're, again, we're talking about bushcraft type stuff here. You're not going to notice an edge holding difference between 8670, 5160, and 1095 if they are ideally heat treated. So you are getting essentially better uh, for however you would quantify this, better than double the toughness of 1095 with 8670 and with 5160 as well. Now, this line that you see here, Oh, God, it's all backwards and it gets me all messed up. This is kind of our um, ideal performance line here and kind of our, our standard line. So our, our, our standard line goes from super blue to 8670. Apex Ultra being really a standout steel, which as I understand it was actually designed specifically by Dr. Laren Thomas. So you could, if you wanted to, argue that there is some bias there. Uh, I have no dog in the fight or bone in the fight, whatever. But uh, essentially, the further that you can get uh, on the positive side of this line, uh, the better. The further you get on the negative side for whatever purposes or intents or whatever, uh, the less good. I really wish I could use my mouse for this. Um, but uh, essentially... For what I am looking for, I'm looking for hard use knives, especially I'm looking at these steels as I am looking at uh, larger hard use fixed blade and combat knives. And we don't have a lot of variables on this list. We don't have cost. We don't have sharpenability. We don't have corrosion resistance, right? Um, so this chart doesn't tell you everything, but, uh, you know, 1095 is, I believe, the industry standard because of its accessibility. It's been one of the most accessible steels in America for decades, for generations. And so if you're going to run a company where you're going to send, sell a gazillion knives a year internationally, it's a good idea to go with 1095 because running out of steel, not being able to buy the size of steel that you need is a really bad deal. Ontario Knife Company ran into this problem with their 5160. They got a whole batch of steel that was uh, a fifth of an inch thick or 0.2 or 0.22 of an inch instead of 0.25. They just decided to run it anyways and had constant problems with that. That's kind of how Ontario rolls. But, uh, you know, ten, again, as your in industry standard here, you've got 1095 here. You've got with no, um, you're not losing anything 
by going with 5160 or 8670, no edge holding. Uh, you're not even really losing cost. They're basically just as affordable uh, for a custom maker. You're doubling the strength. 52100, an amazing, amazing steel balance for edge holding, super fine grain stuff uh, and toughness. L6, crazy tough. Again, L6, right on par with edge holding is 1095, but just under double the toughness. Kuvorge V. Um, Apex Ultra is really cool on this list. I hope that it does become more available because we have better toughness than 1095 and better toughness than a lot of steels. Um, but but good edge holding still. I would like to, I think it'd be cool, maybe I will do this myself at some point, put all of this data for all of the different types of steels onto one chart. For now, let's go on to the next chart because uh, I'll tell you right now, for my bigger knives, for a balance of availability and cost and toughness and resharpenability, I'm going to be choosing 8670 if I can. I'm probably going to be buying it by the sheet. I also... I need to have made in America steels. Uh, so there are a lot of good steels. Uh, AD CRV2, one of my favorite steels. Oddly not on here, it's on one of the other charts. It's on, I wish I would have had that now. But uh, you know, mostly that comes from Germany. I believe there's a US plant that makes it maybe under 1080 plus, although that might be from England. I don't exactly remember, but I need to have an American sourced steel but there are other steels with this level of toughness with better edge holding. We're going to take a look at that right now. And we're going to take a look at some the balance of, of what we're looking at here. So um, let's see. What do we got here? I believe this is my... Nope, that's my stainless. Here we go. So your, your Z-Tough or CD1. This stuff is, like 8670, basically indestructible. But where your... Um, 1095 and 8670 and 5160, you're down here on edge holding at one and a half. You're up here at two and a half with Z tough and ZD1, CD1. You've got a little bit more stain resistance. So uh, we should all use these steels if we want maximum toughness, right? Uh, not necessarily. So again, your downsides, uh, availability, a lot of times it's harder to find different thicknesses in these steels, cost. I talk a lot on this channel about how the cost between a premium and budget steel is not that high per knife. But when you get to the extreme edges of the chart, there is a considerable difference in cost, especially when you're looking at making tens of dozens of hundreds of thousands of when you get into these numbers um your your simple your cost per knife might not be astronomical you're like oh it's just a 50 dollar difference uh cost per knife but your upfront investment might be a difference of 10 20 50 100 thousand dollars so um and if you can't get it in the size that you need it, you can't make your knives. You can't sell your knives if you can't make your knives, right? Okay, so these are fantastic steels. Doot. Now, uh, are they number one recommended on the chart? No, because again, cost and availability. But that brings us to this guy right here, 3V. Basically, the industry standard for a tough fixed blade knife, very corrosion resistant. This is a fantastic balance. We've got more edge holding than Z Tough or CD1 by a considerable margin. We are at four and a half on edge holding on the charts. So, this is superior edge holding to Apex Ultra while simultaneously being way at the top of the charts for toughness. It's a well rounded, absolutely fantastic steel that has become the industry standard. So, it's available. The price is not insane. Uh, now, I'm going to choose 8670 myself over 3V because I want a high carbon steel. I want the ability to um, earn a patina. Ease of sharpening. 3V is not impossible to sharpen, guys, and I'm not here to tell you that it is. I will say for someone new to sharpening, and I'm not a master, for someone new to sharpening, 8670 is going to be easier than 3V. Um, and for outright 
outright toughness 8670 is going to be superior, uh, especially with uh, edge stability, I think. So, but again, if you're wondering um, 3V, you know, is it going to be a good fit for what I want? I like 3V for everything. And so when you bump these toughness numbers up, what does that mean? Well, ideally that means that you can have a thinner edge while still not having damage and a thinner dull edge to the extreme will outperform a thicker sharp edge because you have so much less friction during your cutting or slicing. So thin edges are just, a, 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 your edge thickness uh, dictates your steel performance to just an absolutely huge degree. So again, you look here in our line for your standard, uh, goes across there, Z tough down to, there's Z max, maximum Rex 121. I don't know anything really about Rex 121. I've just heard about it. It's all the way up at edge holding, but all the way down on toughness. And I just remember seeing posts from people like, if you are not a knife nerd, knife person, don't touch these steels. You can have edge chipping and other issues and you need to be really good at sharpening to put an edge on them, whatever the case may be. I have no experience. Z-Max is cool. Uh, doot. I have no experience with 15V. I have no experience with CPM 10V. ZDP seems like a steel that does not make really good sense to me, which is why it's so nice to have some of these charts. D2 is interesting here, guys. So uh, again, your 1095 is at one and a half edge holding, four and a half in toughness. If done properly, your normal D2 is at three and a half on toughness, so not too far behind, but also at a five on edge holding. So your D2 is going to hold an edge better than any of your normal high carbon steels. Um, this is a big deal, guys. Because... The problem with D2 is everybody, every off-brand company, every scam artist, dirtbag fool out there, every company is claiming that they're using D2, whether or not they actually are. Every knife coming from Pakistan, whether it actually comes from Pakistan or they claim it came from England. The dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life is a few companies claiming that they had their knives made in England and finished in shipped and finished in the USA to save costs for the American consumer. And they're selling these knives that look to have some features that are expensive on them at unbelievably affordable prices and people buy it as if you can make anything cheaper in England than you can in America. Goodness. It all came from Pakistan. They claim it's D2. Is it? Who knows? But um, yeah, uh, you know, if I don't have any experience with Wander Tactical, uh, but I would feel confident from what I've heard and seen of Wander Tactical to say you can trust them on this D2 list, you know, older um, uh, Medford knives, you know, in D2. Is it bad because it's in D2? No. Uh, work tough gear, uh, half breed blades. I trust these guys. I trust their D2. I trust their fit and finish and their quality control. So if you get one of these knives from a reputable manufacturer, D2 is a lot better than I have given it credit. The industry gives, it's a lot better than the industry gives it credit for, but specifically, this is about me, a lot better than I have given it credit for. So I got to eat crow on that. I'm going to do a whole video about eating crow on that. I'll be breaking some D2 knives coming up, chipped up D2 knives and resharpen them easily. It's it can be really good stuff. Um, and then, of course, I talked about the other night again, you have a two up here. So you have a whole bar superior edge holding to 1095 and considerably more toughness, uh, a good all around steel. It's air hardened. Uh, here's one thing that I want you guys to think about. We're talking about these steels, okay? We're talking about their potentials. But everything that we're talking about here, all everything on this chart, this is maximum potential, okay? So if you get a knife, this is the what's shown here on this chart is the best that you can hope to get. The reality is you're going to get something 
not as good as this, not as tough, not as good of edge holding, because nothing can consistently be perfect that humans touch. So, um, uh, however, with that being said, that means that the easier a steel is to heat treat, the more likely it is that you got one that is heat treated right. So A2 being air quenched or whatever, air hardened for your heat treat process, if it's easier to heat treat it, more likely that you're going to get all of its performance, it makes it a very good option for customs and small production. Uh, pretty cool. All right, and so that's kind of our list here. I think that's most of what I wanted to say for that. And we'll hop over to uh, stainless. There's some really interesting stuff in uh, in the stainless here. Guys, share this video with your friends because what I'm trying to do here is I am trying to make this easy. That's 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 my goal here. Marketing companies want to vastly oversimplify, which I am doing also. They'll tell you not to look at these charts. When somebody who owns a company or or whatever tells you not to look at these charts from a reputable source like Knife Steel Nerds, uh, maybe ask yourself why, because it is very possible that they're telling you not to trust these charts because the data contradicts their marketing. But uh, like we were looking at before, if you look at, 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 at this here, someone was just telling me on YouTube that AEBL sucks. He didn't have anything to back it up. Um, people think more expensive is more gooder. Okay, it's just as simple as that to them. Uh, don't be stupid. The information is out there and easily accessible. So you don't have to just go off of the marketing. Um, don't just go off of me either. Like, look, I could be lying to you. Um, I could have tweaked his charts for my own benefit to sell you my rectum penetrator 29,000. Okay. And it's in the best deal available. And I put a little dart and dot on somewhere on here, wherever I want. And I, I put my little steel or whatever people lie. Okay. So don't just take my word for it. Go and verify for yourself. People will say not to trust these charts because everybody's heat treat is different. And that is true. Again, these are ideal heat treats. Now, I kept, I talked about this line in this video, I forgot to in the last video being kind of your par for performance across the chart. This would have been va a vastly different line if it was not for MagnaCut. It, the line does seem actually probably a little bit optimistic to me. It kind of seems like it should probably go from Nitro V down to CPM S110V with Magna Cut being well on the high side of the line. But regardless, um, look at this. I don't know you who are watching, most likely. I probably don't know you, okay? But you probably say that 420HC sucks. And yet, ideally heat treated, we have more heat treating than 1090, more edge holding, uh, one and a half to two and a half, a whole bar over, right? Uh, and we have a toughness at nine with excellent uh, stainless properties and incredibly easy to sharpen. So you've got edge holding of A2, sharpenability probably easier than A2, more toughness, if we could get away from the marketing and the oversimplification and the more expensive equals more gooder, I'm gonna buy the most expensive knife steel. Sometimes things aren't expensive because they're better or even more expensive to make in and of themselves. Sometimes things are more expensive because they come from a smaller shop that has to charge more. It's more of a boutique steel. There's value in there. I'm not, I'm not hating on that. Anything from Zap Industries is more expensive. Do I want knives and zap steels? Yeah, it's Gucci. It's cool. It's 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 cool, right? But is it is it necessarily 
better. Here's the thing. No one steel is the best. Steels are the best for an intended task and use on an intended blade. If you have a knife in Vanex X, X, XHP uh, instead of Magna Cut, don't, don't throw it away, or even S35. They're absolutely fantastically balanced steels, wonderful steels. They meet, you know, S35 here, we've got a little more toughness than 1095 and way better edge holding. And it's not that hard to sharpen. It is harder to sharpen. It's not that hard. You can strop it. I strop all of my knives. Uh, again, um, okay, so let's let's wrap this up here. And here's the most important thing. I guess I saved the most important thing for last. Here's the most important thing. Value. Price. Okay. I see every single day. Most recently about Mora. Why would I buy that Mora for $280 when I could buy, I'm going to say, Condor in a superior steel, I believe they have one in 14C28N, for one one-hundredth the price? I'm not picking on Condor and I'm not picking on Mora. What I'm saying is um, buying the cheaper knife because it has a more expensive steel does not mean you got a better value because the cost of your knife comes from the time that it took to make it. The amount that they are paying good, skilled employees and the time it takes those employees. So you can have bull crap, J. Bob, hillbilly, uncle, nephew, neph son guy out here and you can pay him seven dollars an hour to make knives and you can make them in a super expensive steel let's just say uh cpm s90 v or 110 v okay and you can end up with a product with zero toughness and worse edge holding than 1095. So if you buy this knife because you're like, man, it's $50 cheaper than this other knife from a reputable maker or manufacturer and it's in a superior steel, are you getting the superior deal? The answer is no. And on the flip side of that, we've got these companies out here. I don't trust them to heat treat 1075, 1085, or 1095. Why would I pay more for them to make me a knife in a steel that's harder to heat treat, harder to grind. Where's the value? It's not there. Paid a little more in steel, they got an easy sale to someone whose understanding of steel is vastly uh, oversimplified. But guess what, guys? There are gonna be a lot of knives out there that are made uh, in Magna Cut that are just gonna suck. And, and it doesn't have to be just heat treat. They mess up the heat treat, the knife's ruined, but it doesn't just have to be heat treat. It can also be edge thickness. Did they grind the edge straight? Is it warped? Does it have hairline fractures from the manufacturer? Um, so these are all, all things to consider, guys. Overall value does not come from steel choice. I've been bagging on Mora, selling these Moras for $280. I would spend $280 to get a Mora if I was going on a big trip before I would spend $80 on a company that I don't trust Snife in any steel, even if it is Gucci or not. Uh, on the flip side, uh, you know, if you can pick up a Mora Cans Bowl or S2000 for 30 bucks, you can't you can't beat that value because you've got 1227 done correctly. There, I've I've in my opinion, I've got a whole bunch of Moras. I've known I don't can't tell you how many people I've known that have had Moras. Never seen one that was wrong, really. I've heard 
of ones that were ground a little bit off or ground a little bit wrong, but I've never personally owned one that was wrong or that performed poorly. And that's huge. And again, your uh, 12C27 is, I think, going to be essentially right here with your 420HC in performance. So people are keep crapping on 12C27, probably one of my favorite steels, better edge holding potential than 1095 and double the toughness. How do you beat that? And it's easy to sharpen. And it's got good stainless properties. So anyways, guys, um, part of this is like being pedantic. Okay, I am pedantic. There are people in videos who I agree with overall, but who are just focusing too much on the type of steel that they're talking about. And I've got to be like, yeah, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah, it's too expensive, but like, let's stop talking about the knife steel. Guys, the cost in the knife comes from the time and quality control is time. You, a lot of these companies aren't doing quality control. They're doing batch quality control. You have to pay someone who knows what they're looking at, someone who is anal to the max to look at every single knife from a production company. That's time. That's big, big money. You have to pay for that. That doesn't come for free. Okay. So time. The time that goes into every knife is worth far more than the materials in any knife. And a guy who's been in the industry for so long, who's so good at his job that he can work a hundred times faster than another guy. It doesn't mean that his knife is worth less. It's probably worth more because you're paying for that guy's experience and expertise and the quality of product that he makes. Congratulations to him at getting so good, but it took him time to get to that point. Probably talked for too long. I hope this video has been helpful. Again, guys, I have no dog in this fight whatsoever. I mean, 440A, freaking give me a knife in 440A. That's perfectly heat treated. I don't care. Oh. Um, ALS 8, AUS 8, or 8CR 13 MOV. I don't want a knife in 8CRV. I don't like buying a Chinese steel. But look at this. You've uh, 8 USA, you've got a 3 on your edge retention and a 6 on your toughness. Double the edge holding of 1095, considerably more toughness on what's now considered a budget, trash, cheap, junk knife steel. Again, any steel can be a junk steel. Any knife can be a junk knife if it wasn't properly made. That does not mean that your ALS 8 is a junk steel though, because it can be made very good. But would I ever choose ALS 8? No. Boom. Nitro V gives up nothing. Boom. LC200N almost entirely impervious to corrosion. Boom. 14C28N AEBL, 14C28N, almost impervious to corrosion. Uh, and maintaining edge holding, 14C should also be quite affordable and obtainable. Uh, you know, I don't know. But uh, it certainly is on the market. Um, so a company that uses the steel a lot, I would trust 14C28N in a heartbeat. If White River Knife and Tool who does everything, in my opinion, to an incredibly high degree of professionalism. If they did everything in 14C28N, especially for a bigger, I would be, I'd be overjoyed. I think that would, I think that would be awesome. 420HC. You think that White River Knife and Tool, do you think that their products would be considerably cheaper if they used 420HC? No, because that's not what you're paying for. They'd probably be the exact same price. Now, as I understand it, you can stamp 420HC out with a giant press that can save an incredible amount of time. Maybe that would save you money. Maybe you would save $20 to $40 per knife from White River Knife and Tool. I'm not speaking for them. So, you know, don't hold them to this. But maybe they could offer these knives if they were to completely tool up and commit to 420HC. Maybe they could offer every knife that they offer at $20 to $40 
cheaper because the stampability. Their knives would be freaking awesome. Their knives in 420HC would still blow anything in 1095 out of the water in absolutely 100% every category be so easy to sharpen. Here's what, okay, Jake, then why don't they do it? Because you wouldn't buy them. This video is not going to make it out to everybody. People would not buy a knife with the attention of detail and quality control uh, that White River Knife and Tool offers at the cost that it takes for White River Knife and Tool to do what they do and get a steel in 420 HC. They wouldn't buy it. But what I'm here to tell you is if it wasn't for the marketing, if, if they would buy it, if people were just basing their decisions on data, they were trying to become educated as they were choosing their steels, that those knives would be the freaking cream of the crop, the coolest freaking knives around. Again, almost CPM, basically CPM 3V toughness, way better corrosion resistance, way easier to sharpen, not quite as much edge holding. In a big old fixed blade, talk about what could be a grail steel, any of these up here, a grail steel, and they're viewed as inferior and crap because they're offered in affordable knives. They're offered in affordable knives because they're freaking, they can crank them out fairly quickly, but um, they're really tough. So companies can, all right, this video's already gone too long. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. I, uh, if you are looking for my knives, uh, at Exodus Knife and Tool. I do have some in stock at the time of filming. I think I've got 10 Jackalopes and I think I've got four Adventure Crafts. If you want one, I would encourage you to go get it. I have Afterpay or PayPal payments or wherever you don't have to have a PayPal account. You can make four interest-free payments, but there's probably going to be a bit of a dry spell where these are all going to sell out in between this video and when I get my next batch. Uh, stay in the loop, guys. Wix is screwing me on my uh, emails to send out to people to let people know when stuff is going on. Follow my blog at exodusknifeandtool.com. Follow my Instagram and Facebook. I will keep you guys up to date if I can. Thank you for watching. I hope that you have a blessed day. Let me know if you enjoyed. Actually, let me know if you really hated this video like usual. Let me write me a couple paragraphs. I think that would really be great. And um, and let me know if you enjoyed this kind of video. We can go more in depth about my experience with certain steels on the chart or my opinions on them for certain uses. We can talk more about different size knives and, uh, and different steel choices. Uh, I don't know... Maybe on Patreon, I'll do a video where I talk about manufacturers. Uh, I do have a Patreon, and I, I am going to start uploading behind-the-scenes videos to Patreon and videos that are a little bit too spicy for general consumption. Uh, so that might be the route that I go for Patreon. That might be something where... I offer things that are a little bit much for the general population or for um, whatever. You know, that's how this industry works. I told the truth about Dave at Ultimate Survival Tips and his MSK1 as I saw them in a review. He lied uh, to me and about me publicly. That pisses me off more than anything. So I blatantly put the truth out there. Next thing you know, boom, Condor doesn't want to work with me because Condor is working with Dave and Joe Flowers doesn't appreciate that. You know, it is what it is. Uh, you tell the truth about stuff, it's going to piss people off. So I think um, we'll get into some of the nitty and gritty and start doing more behind the scenes on Patreon. If you're into that kind of thing, uh, consider supporting there. It might cost you the cost of like less than one coffee a month. And if I start doing this uh, behind the scenes stuff more often, it'll be worth more than a coffee. Have a blessed day. Talk to you later.